and welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and it's time for another monthly reading wrap up. In the month of November, I read a total of nine books, so a bit less than these past two, three months. As such, I will this time go through the books I read in simple chronological order. So, first I reread My Dark Vanessa by Kate Elizabeth Russell. I did this right after rereading Lolita so I could do a couple of videos about them, revisiting my thoughts about both these novels and also to do a comparison video for both of these novels. You're more than free to go check these out. I don't really think I need to say much more than that. I talk extensively about these two books in those two videos and I also have separate reviews for both Lolita and My Dark Vanessa. Like I said though, quickly, I downgraded My Dark Vanessa just a bit after my reread. I gave it a 7.5 out of 10 instead of like an original 9 or something. I still think it's a valuable novel. It has a lot of things to bring to the table in terms of discussing consent, grooming, sexual abuse, the consequences of all these things, etc. But I don't think the writing style or the character development is quite up to par. And I was even more irritated by the way I felt the author handled traumatic dissociation and the sexual aspect of the main character's relationship with her abusive teacher. But like I said, for more details, go check out my videos if you want. Alongside that, well, let's say emotionally draining read, let's put it that way, I read this little gem of a graphic novel, La Fille dans l'écran de Mano Devo et Lou Luby. This was so bloody wholesome and sweet. It's basically a lesbian love story that starts online and long distance between an aspiring French illustrator and a French expat living in Quebec. She did not she gone there to study photography but then got in a couple with a man and then became a barista but she's not very satisfied with her life and they engage in a relationship that starts out as a lovely friendship because the young French woman wants to use the French expats photographies as references for a graphic novel she's working on with animals and parrots and things like that and so they start talking and well they lived happily ever after basically I'm simplifying obviously but I loved also the fact that the younger French illustrator suffers from social anxiety so I enjoyed that mental illness representation I love the fact that she had a pet cockatoo that always gonna give bonus points to a book for me and I did actually a short review for this graphic novel in French for once so if you happen to be a follower of mine who also speaks French, then I invite you to check that review out. But yeah, otherwise, lovely graphic novel. Maybe if my fellow English speakers are lucky enough, this will get translated one day. Who knows? It sometimes happens. Then I finally did it. I got into Dune by Frank Herbert, and I still cannot get over how ugly this edition is. But thankfully, it shall be replaced very, very soon. And I loved it. Yes, you know what? I did love it. I mean, I didn't adore it. I did give it a 7.5 out of 10, but I have immense respect for what Brian Herbert created with his Dune verse. I say this because I've already read actually the first three books. I'm about to start God Emperor of Dune tomorrow. But it was amazing. The world building, the theming are on such a high bloody level. This book is smart. It is smart in capital letters and you can hear me rave about that in the review I did for the first book in the series. Like I said, I'll also be doing a series review when I've completed all of these six books 
in the Doomverse hexology. But so yeah, it was amazing. I completely understand why this is a classic on the level of talking but for science fiction or science fantasy if you want, sure. But yeah, it's amazing. I have immense respect. It's smart. And without spoiling anything, Paul Trades is kind of a dick. Yes. And I wrote this down in the description box for my review for Doom. But to my fellow A Song of Ice and Fire fans, I'd say Paul Atreides is a more arsehole hybrid of Daenerys Targaryen and perhaps Bran Stark. I'll let you make of that what you will. <laughs> then I also read volume 5 of Saga. Yes, I'm continuing with that amazing graphic novel series. I mean, at this point, I can't really say anything about the plot or the characters without spoiling major elements. Suffice it to say, I'm continuing to enjoy this immensely. It continues to be a wild romp, but also has actually really good character development and you really get attached to the characters and there's great diversity as well and crazy plot twists and different plot threads that intertwine. So excited to see where it will lead me next. That's all I can really say at this point. So then I continued on my trek into the Dune saga with a Dune Messiah, which is considerably shorter <laughs> than Dune and Children of Dune. Um, well, I don't want to spoil the plot, but I really, really enjoyed this. I get the sense that a lot of people read Dune and then stop there and don't continue on with the entire series, but that's just not how I roll. When I commit to a series, I commit. <laughs> so yeah. I continued on with Dune Messiah, and I have to agree with those who are fans of the Dune series, you kind of need to go on with at least books two and three to truly appreciate what Frank Herbert was doing with the plot and the themes of the first book, Dune. To me, they have to go together in a way, so if you've only read Dune, at least read Dune Messiah and Children of Dune after it. You'll get a much better sense of what Frank Herbert was trying to accomplish, the messages he was trying to hammer home. I don't always completely agree with said message or with the way it's delivered, mind you, but I'll get back to that in my series review. But again, immense respect for the world building, the theming, the depths to which Frank Herbert goes with his ideas about religion, science, politics, the intertwining of all those things. And even though I do think character development isn't bad, for me at least it's hard to get attached to the characters because talk about shades of great characters, like way before Grimdark there was this, all the characters are basically great characters, or at least almost all of them. And it's hard to really like many of them, but um, it puts a lot of things into perspective, especially with the main figure of the first Dune book, Paul Atreides. And yeah, I, I really think you should at least read the original, like, more or less self-contained trilogy. So alongside of that, technically, actually, <laughs> I read four books last week, but I'm dividing those four books into two groups of two. So I also read this, my one non-fiction book of the month, a French language book, Creux des Lacans du Charlatan, question mark, by Jacques Van Rillard, who is a Belgian psychologist. This basically is a book which demolishes psychoanalysis, or at the very least, frudo lacanian psychoanalysis, which has a lot of sway and influence in France, and also in Argentina, for whatever reason. And so it kind of goes over what Freudian psychoanalysis is, what his theories were, what his practice was like, and then it touches upon the figure of Jacques Lacan, which I don't know if he's really that well known outside of France. <laughs> he did get intellectually bitch slapped by Noam Chomsky back in the day, which I find hilarious. Because Jacques Lacan, you have to understand, got even in a way trippier with his bullshit than Freud, who was like obsessed with sex and the Oedipus complex, etc. etc. Lacan was like doing weird ass crap with language, and it kind it belongs to this general postmodern deconstructivist, what I personally consider bullshit. I'm sure there's some stuff in there that's redeemable and that's useful from an academic intellectual perspective, but like generally speaking, for practical everyday life. So Lacanian psychoanalysts basically deconstruct words infinitely 
and it becomes completely nonsensical. The dude would also like draw mathematical demonstrations on whiteboards to explain concepts of the unconscious. <laughs> and like physicists, mathematicians, and linguists all just laughed at him. Like they didn't take him seriously at all. Personally, in my theory, the guy was a massive, massive troll. He was trolling everyone. A bit like some of these postmodern artists who would like, you know, splash a dot of black paint on a white canvas. They were making fun of people. I'm profoundly convinced that it's just a massive exercise in trolling. And that's how they got off, basically. It's kind of like that running meme slash joke, which obviously is an overgeneralization. Don't at me like I know, but you know, that all of these high intellectual spheres are just a bunch of mostly straight white guys jerking off to pictures of themselves, which I find funny. And like I said, it's an overgeneralization. We're all agreed, right? I'm not trashing the entirety of Western philosophy and linguistics, etc., etc. but there is something to it, though. And Freud himself, well, basically, the point of this book is to show you that Freud was mostly con artists. I don't think he was quite as much of a con artist as Lacan. I really do think Lacan was a massive troll. Like, he himself said that what he was doing was bullshit to fool the idiotic masses. Like, he was a troll and an asshole. Freud, I think, he started out initially trying to help people, being a doctor and things like that, but then he just created this cult of personality around him. That's what it is. Psychoanalysis is a cult or a sect. It's weird that it still has so much sway in France because it's fairly obvious once you start taking a closer look at it. So yeah, I think Freud was a massive narcissist, if nothing else. And the gist of it is, most of his ideas weren't his own ideas. He plagiarized a lot of older authors. So basically what that means is not everything that came out of like psychoanalysis is necessarily trash bin worthy. Like the concept of the subconscious isn't an absurd concept or that dreams can represent things that have traumatized you, things like that. Like, those are all valid concepts, and some of them have even kind of been sort of confirmed by neuroscience. So that's fine, but the problem is he took a lot of ideas which weren't his original creations, and then he generalized them to the extreme and then focused exclusively on sex, phallocentrism, the Oedipus complex, and a bunch of crazy ass bitch. No, I mean, really, when you start reading into this stuff, you realize how truly crazy it was, and you start to wonder, how did anyone take this stuff seriously? And basically, he never actually cured anyone. A lot of his patients never got better. Some of them got even worse, ended their lives in psychiatric asylums. It's freaking sad. The only real critique I have about this book, which was really, really good, and it has a lot of sources and references in the bibliography at the back, the author himself was a psychoanalytic psychologist for a big chunk of his career, and then he got converted to cognitive behavioral therapies. Sometimes I felt like he was maybe trying to preach a bit too much for his new adopted choir, you know, like the preaching of the converted, which rubbed me just a bit the wrong way. I do think CBT has a lot more scientific evidence to back it up, but it's not a panacea either. There are studies that have shown that CBT has lost a lot of its effectiveness, especially for depression over the years, because guess what? The placebo effect is also a thing in psychotherapy, and then there have been studies that have shown that what matters most is the therapeutic alliance between the patient and the therapist, not so much the type of therapy. So I'm like, calm down with your worshipping of CBT. Plus, it's a bit weird to compare CBT to psychoanalysis because very little psychotherapists practice true psychoanalysis these days outside of France and Argentina, so you should have been comparing CBT and psychodynamic psychotherapy, and he doesn't really mention any other type of psychotherapy. It's like, oh, CBT is the one scientific psychotherapy, and I'm like, it's better, but like, it's far from perfect either. It doesn't always work, so slow your roll down just a wee bit, mate. And I was also slightly disappointed that he didn't mention the fact that it's kind of known now that Freud actually was on the right track initially with thinking that his female patients who suffered from like 
hysteria at the time, had been sexually abused and was suffering from freaking PTSD. But since they were oftentimes daughters of, well, men of high Viennese society, it was just a tad bit inconvenient to confront them to the fact that they had molested or raped their own daughters. So he was quietly asked to uh, look elsewhere for a psychological psychotherapeutic explanation and so that just contributed to his errors sexism and misogyny so fuck you freud <laughs> that's my message otherwise a very good book like i said so i read do messiah i was reading that book about frudo lacanian psychoanalysis and then i got on to children of dune still by Frank Herbert, obviously. Yeah, I can't really say much without spoiling the plot. But yeah, it was great. I wonder if I didn't prefer Children of Dune to Doom Messiah and Dune. It gets a lot more complex. Well, I mean, there are multiple points of view in Dune, which I actually forgot to mention in my <laughs> review. And so you also have multiple points of view here. And all of these snippets from like future history about messianic figure of Paul Atreides, I won't say more than that. And it deals with his legacy, the legacy of his ascension to power and his descendants. I had a hard time rating it. I think it still kind of all sits at a 7.5 out of 10 and perhaps just creeping towards that eight, but not quite because I adore the world building, I adore the theming, but sometimes even for me it gets a bit lost in its own philosophical slash mystical explorations that take place in the minds of some of the characters, and it gets a bit complicated. I mean, I can still follow it, but it becomes a bit convoluted and shrouded in its own self-created mystique in a way. It's, it's weird to explain. I was actually reminded at one point of that short story by Ted Chang, which was called, I cannot remember, but it was basically a riff off of Flowers for Algen, and you got two super intelligent dudes like fighting it out in their minds. And there was a wee bit of that in there because it deals with people who are almost superhuman and a person who might become something else than human. I'll leave it at that. And so it's such on a high plane of metaphysical dialectic. It might be just a wee bit self-indulgent at times. Don't get me wrong, I love good philosophical, mystical, metaphysical, spiritual developments and explorations and discussions. There are times I wonder if you didn't go just a wee bit overboard with it in there. Because it, well, it does come a bit at the expense of like plot development and then character development but like i said there isn't really a problem with character development as such but there's so much in their own heads and they're so above most humans that you have a really hard time relating to them i did relate to one of the characters because one of the characters is a fairly tragic female one and i was like oh man it really sucks what's happening to you i genuinely feel sorry for you it's still amazing but it's definitely challenging literature i'll leave it at that for now I'll come back to all of this in my series review, of course. And finally, last week, I read this magnificent graphic novel called Anaïs Nin sur la mer des mensonges. Anaïs Nin was a writer who wrote, among other things, erotic literature, beautiful erotic literature. She was my favorite erotica writer, and she wrote a crap ton of personal diaries and journals as well. And she had an interesting life. She, I wouldn't say she was a free love advocate, because I don't think she ever advocated for anything really, but she practiced free love in a way. She had a lot of lovers, and she genuinely loved the men she had intimate connections with. She was famously the love of Henry Miller. It is presumed that she also had a sexual affair with Henry Miller's wife, June. She also had an incestuous relationship with her cousin, Eduardo, but she also stayed married to her husband, Hugo, and she was abused as a child by her father, but then she idealized her father and probably had incestuous contacts with her father as an adult. That's present in this graphic novel, and that was pretty hard to get through, but it's not glorified in any way, it's not justified, it's just presented as a part of 
Anna Isnin's complex psychology and complex life history. It is a biographical graphic novel, but it doesn't retell her entire life. It focuses on basically the years she spent knowing Henry Miller, though there are flashbacks to like her childhood when her father left and things like that. And it is one of the most beautiful graphic novels I have ever read. This artist, well, is a true artist. If I can just give you an example of, well, the art style, it's things like these. It's really my kind of thing, 100%. It also helps massively that the story takes place in like the 1920s and 30s. I absolutely adore the aesthetic of that period of history. And it was just deeply moving and touching because it really goes into the psychology of Anna Isnin. There are a lot of things in her that I could personally relate to. Some things I couldn't because pretty important divergences in our life histories thankfully. But yeah, it really, it moved me to tears by the end. And I'll probably actually be rereading this graphic novel this week because I almost feel I went through it too quickly this past week. And also for those of you who follow me and also speak or at least understand French, I just did a short-ish review for this graphic novel in French. And finally, this wasn't at all on my November TBR, but let's just say that uh, I had a very bad day yesterday, and well, I had to take some medication. I was very foggy, went to bed very early, and then I got up in the middle of the night and then couldn't sleep anymore. So I was like, screw it, I'm going to read something until I'm tired again. So uh, I took the opportunity of finishing Children of Dune, and then I was like, well, I have this short-ish book of graphic nonfiction I can go through fairly quickly, so might as well do that. So I also read in a single sitting The Prince Passy Charmant by an author illustrator called Emma. I had initially bought this because I thought it was going to address from a feminist angle obviously be me, things like amateur normativity and the way little girls are encouraged to like seek a soulmate and settle down in a heterosexual relationship and how that's portrayed in media and things like that. I knew that this author had also done a, well, it became famous, a comic strip about organizational labor. In French it's called La Charge Mentale. I think in English it translates to like, so you have emotional labor, domestic labor, we have like organizational slash mental labor. And she did a comic strip about it that kind of went viral at the time, I think. I was expecting things around this idea of that like the prince in the Disney movie isn't something girls should desire or aspire to obtain and it was sort of well no it wasn't really in there I guess it was a book about feminist topics but it was more things like the concept of benevolent sexism okay that was explained this like I said organizational slash mental labor was also re-explained even though apparently she talks about it in another one of her published compendiums of comics and then there was like a whole big chapter about capitalist exploitation which don't get me wrong I'm all for explaining and exposing to the general population but that's just not what I was expecting at all overall I guess what I'm trying to say is I was kind of disappointed in this book like it's not bad it's pretty decent at explaining some feminist concepts in a more fun format, I guess. You know, it's these kinds of little comic strips, illustrations with little explanations and things. And that was fine. I was a bit confused that that big bit about like capitalist exploitation and trying to promote shorter work weeks and more egalitarian work schemes of the communist slash left-wing libertarian type wasn't put in relation to feminist theory, so it felt a bit disjointed with the rest, and the thing about benevolent versus malevolent sexism was useful, sure, but it wasn't anything new to me, so fairly basic for someone with a more advanced understanding of feminist theory, I guess. I might give another one of these, like, uh, collected editions mentioned in the back there a shot next year. Maybe that's supposed to be about emotional labor, but there might be other things in it as well. I don't know. As a right, I gave it a 6 out of 10. That's all I can really say. 
So those were all the books I read in the month of November. In December, I'll obviously be continuing with the Dune saga. I have God Emperor Dune, Heretics of Dune, and Chapter House Dune to go through. And I should be reading a few graphic novels, comic books, but they haven't arrived in the mail yet because, well, with bloody COVID and everyone doing their Christmas shopping online, there's a crap ton of parcels to be, well, sorted at the national post offices. So I'm a bit miffed about that because I gotta wait. <laughs> and that's annoying and I'm gonna run out of books at this rate, so hopefully a few of them come in this week. Also, this might be the last video I actually film before taking a short month-long leave of absence for health reasons, but I have pre-filmed and pre-uploaded videos for you to enjoy during these coming weeks. So in the meantime, I hope you're all doing as well as you can in the current circumstances. I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whichever you prefer. Take good care of yourselves, and I shall see you in the next video. Bye-bye.